Before beginning the talk, I thought to bring the love and greetings of the Bethel family to you. We've got a big family there in Brooklyn and at the farm. So uh, this is my privilege to discharge that responsibility, and I'm happy to do this, brothers. And knowing, knowing too, that there are many from here in this locality that are serving with us there in Brooklyn, we're happy to have these young men in our midst. It might be good, too, to say that it's nice to be out of New York City this time of the year, although I must admit that the weather in New York City has been absolutely fabulous. You know, we've had one of the nicest climates, Indian summers that we've had on record. And just when I left there, the temperature was between anywhere from 50 to 75 degrees this time of the year. And it's a nice thing for us to have this warm temperature, primarily because we're doing so much building. And uh, if it were not for the warm temperature, we wouldn't pour the wouldn't be able to pour the cement that we're pouring and doing the building up at the farm and uh, in the factory too. We're putting up a three-story building on top of building three, on top of the tenth floor there for our chill roller system and the warm weather has come in handy. I don't know how many of you have been able to get your yearbooks yet. Uh, mind tell you little bits and pieces of things that have happened around the world and some of the things that the yearbook reports. For those of you who have not received it, whet your appetite. It's a very, very beautiful report that we received and we appreciate it very much. One thing it shows us that People are coming into the truth. And uh, I might just say that many who have left are now returning. And uh, everything is very, very fine. It's nice to see this, brothers. You take, for example, the pioneers have gone up 14.3%. 172,000 pioneers today. My, that's an awful lot of people devoting to full-time service at the present time. And it shows that the spirit is there. It's a fine spirit. It's a good spirit. It shows you're thinking in the right direction. New congregations, 44,953 congregations throughout the world. That's an increase, too. The memorial figure this year went way over the six million mark. 6,252,787. 6 million shows what a potential there is. And if that potential were ever to be realized, one thing we do know, we do know there are not enough kingdom halls right now to help us out and take care of all this interest. We see something is happening in Brooklyn, for example, not too many years ago. 1950, there were only 355 people in the Brooklyn Bethel family. That's not long ago. Maybe for you young people, it might seem a long time ago. But when you start getting gray hairs, 1950 looks like yesterday. And, and that's the truth. Only 355. When I went to Bethel, there were uh, 252 people in Bethel. Today, you know what there is in Bethel family? There are over 2,157 in the Bethel family. We're actually taking 157 of those people and we're housing them in the hotel. We have not enough room anymore in the Bethel homes to take care of the Bethel family. So they're staying in hotels. So you young people, any of you coming to Bethel, it might be that you'll be staying at the Standish Arms hotel until we get something better for you to live in. I say better because some of those hotels, be they what they are, uh, they leave something to be desired, right? Yes, I know. Some of you visit. We're trying to clean the place up. We're remodeling it now. We're using sprays and everything else that we possibly can. Hopefully, when you come to visit us, we'll have a better home for you. But until such time, as the French say, c'est la vie, make the best of your life. Is At least it is a block and a half from Bethel, what else do you want? And you're not paying $100 a night. 
And some of you stay up so late you'd hardly sleep at all. So, my goodness, to pay $100 for a hotel room down in Manhattan is something else. Well, I want you to know there, there's a great revolution happening at Bethel right now. And the way things are happening and things are being done... And it's an exciting time to be living at Bethel. It's so exciting we don't know what's happening, really. Because the field is exploding, and our work in the Bethel family is exploding, too. You take, for example, there's a whole new language being spoken at Bethel. You take, you take for example, we're talking about catalytic exchangers. Can you imagine? A couple of years ago, wouldn't even know what they're talking about. A catalytic exchanger. Chill rollers. We have now laser scanners, digitizers, 4300s, 3083s. We have automatic climate control. We have computer controls. We have recording studios, tape recordings studios. In fact, it was so fantastic that not so long ago, an IBM man came through. And I gave a talk up at uh, London, Ontario, where we have an assembly hall up there. And uh, there was this brother in the truth. He said he went to the seminar for the IBM people, and they asked him where he was from. And he said, I'm from the assembly hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. And they said, oh, my. And uh, when they all introduced themselves in the seminar, this is quite a school, then this man said, you from the Watchtower, would you come up here and tell us about what you're doing there at the Watchtower? And the brother at the assembly hall had not the slightest idea. And he said, what am I, what am I going to talk to, them, to these people about? So he got up there, and you know what he did? He gave them a talk, a sermon. He was telling them about... Matthew twenty four fourteen that the good news has to be preached in all the world for a witness. There are people speaking in hundreds of different languages, and it is the desire of the society now to reach these people with the news, kingdom good news, and the only way we think we can do it is through computers, and we're developing our own computer. And the fact of the matter, we're doing what they said at one time couldn't be done. And we have a, a board there, a council, computer council, that our brother can use this console and type on it. English will come up on the board, and he'll say, well, what about the Hebrew word, Sheol? And he wants this in Hebrew. All he has to do is push a button, and on the board will come the Hebrew word. And he can push another button, and on the board will come a Greek word. He can push another button, and in Arabic. And we're getting to the point that whatever language you want, that keyboard can respond to it. And we're developing another machine there that if we can ever get it to work, we're going to have a system that is going to thrill, not only thrill the Lord's people, but the worldly people have got their eyes on it too. Ah, yes, because in fact in Japan, when the brothers developed their computer system, I know at the time, Brother Ishii, who was a scientist in Japan, came into the truth. Some little dear sister knocking at the door, and this scientist came. She didn't know him from Adam, you know. And she pressed the button, and he came to the door, and she says, Would you like to live forever? Oh, he says, Woman, that's impossible. And she says, It is, though, and here's God's word. And this scientist was so humble he came into the organization and he invited other scientists and they came into the organization and today they developed a computer system for us there because the Japanese keyboard has some oh, over 2,000 characters I think it runs between about 2,500 characters in their alphabet can you imagine that you have 26 and you struggle with it you see, and there they have 2,000, and they're having quite a time. They have done it in Japan. Now the magazines are coming out, and the books are coming out, and they're being developed off the computer system developed by the Lord's people. Isn't that beautiful? Jehovah doing his marvelous work, wonders to perform.
I was talking to you about Bethel. I got all the way to Japan. We got a Bethel there, too. But anyway, you know we have over 500 sisters at Bethel? 500. That's almost pretty good. About half of this crowd. All sisters at Bethel. And uh, what a job they do. Of course, they work in about every job we have there. And uh, marvelous things. But one thing they don't do yet, they don't work in our kitchen. We're trying to get them there because we've got some sisters that are good cooks. But think about preparing meals for 3,000 six foot six men. Because in Bethel, I feel like a midget. Because these young ones, I don't know what you do with them out there, but you roll them out real tall when they come there. Skinny and tall. They all look like basketball players. They can, We have to put some meat on those bones, but... Lo and behold, and when they come to Bethel, they eat like they never saw food in their lives. But they don't like to do the dishes, though. And we're training them to do the dishes. But we have in the Bethel home, we have people from the Chinese extraction, Japanese, Filipinos, Spanish, Italians, French, Canadians, Germans, Polish, Russians, Arabic, Indians, you name it, we have it at Bethel. And we're living in peace. And this is what the world desires, isn't it? Over there across the river from us is the United Nations Organization. They've been sweating blood since 1945 to bring nations together. And all they've done is divided them. And here we have it, right before their eyes. People from all nations, roommates, living together, loving each other, and getting God's work done. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says Jehovah. And that's the only way it can happen, brothers. We are not doing this work in our own strength, but it's by the spirit and the love of God. When you look to see how some of these young ones are coming there, because everything is changing now. Now, in the computer room, you, you don't see the strapping man that used to handle a pick and shovel. You see a skinny guy kind of bent over with spectacles, you know. And he walks in there and he knows all, all the terminologies and everything and he gets the job done. I don't know what he'd do with a pick and shovel, but lo and behold, for in this day and age, he's able to get a job done. But we do have these tall men now working on presses. And they're fine. You take, for example, now when we print a book, you take this Live Forever book. It's a beautiful book. And brothers are pacing it now in the field, even though they're supposed to wait a while. They're so excited they're placing it in the field. This book represents three small books, pocket books in one. But when we print a book like that, it means that we have to not only print one book, but we've got to print five million books right off the top. You know what it takes to print five million books? That's a gigantic undertaking. In the world, when they have a bestseller, they sell 100,000 books, and they think they've sold an awful lot of books. Well, that's hardly a day's job for us. And that's the truth. In our burst binder, we run 80,000 books a day in an eight-hour shift off the burst binder. And we're nowhere near. And this only gives you an idea of what's happening there. Well, the truth is, the devil is not happy with what he's seeing. And we're having problems, too, around the world. In Nicaragua, they've taken over some of the kingdom halls. Some of our brothers are in prison. Cuba, for some unknown reason, has once again turned hard on us. Of course, for years, we've got some of our brothers been in Cuban prisons for almost 20 years now. And I wish we, you brothers wouldn't forget them in your prayers. Remember them, because they need them. It's, it's rough to be in the Cuban prisons. In Singapore, the officials for years have turned their back on us, but now they've arrested some of our brothers, and we don't know why. Ethiopia and Korea have been hard on our dear brothers. Korea, because of the military issue, Ethiopia has persecuted our brothers. But our brothers, notwithstanding in Korea, uh, the military issue is the big issue there, but we are building and have built a whole new Bethel there in Korea. 
and we're putting in a printing plant there. So it's sort of a paradox. We're having persecution and success in Korea. Russia, well, Tavarash, it's hard to say what's happening in Russia. You find just recently there was a, on the front page of Pravda newspaper, there was an article printed about one of Jehovah's Witnesses there. And he was a young man. And he was going from house to house in Russia and he was arrested. And uh, actually he wasn't arrested for going from house to house, but he was arrested for not taking up the military or going into the military. And the judge, the whole trial is printed on the front page. Talk about a, a witness. And on this front page of the Pravda newspaper, the judge and the whole transcript is given how this man came into the truth, how Bible study was held with him, how he used to go to the meetings, attend assemblies in the woods, and everything else, and he came to conviction that it was wrong to kill your fellow man, it's against God's law, and he would refuse to do so, and he prefers to go to prison then to take up the military. And they printed this all on the front page of the newspaper. But it shows one thing, that the brothers in Russia are act active, and that people are coming into the truth. And nowadays, of course, they have cameras, they have microfilms and everything else. It's very, very, very difficult to keep the truth out of so-called forbidden places. There is no boundaries anymore. The truth just seeps across these lines, goes into these countries, because at one time we had a huge organization in Czechoslovakia, but when Russia took over Czechoslovakia, she literally opened the door for Jehovah's Witnesses to travel from Western Germany into Czechoslovakia and into Russia, and for us to really get in contact with the brothers there. But of all these countries, one of the strangest things was Poland. You wonder what on earth is happening in Poland, and the beautiful thing about it is that our brothers are having a heyday in Poland, truth-wise. And that's not an exaggeration. Food is hard to come by. They're pinching pennies, and there's vodkas and things like that to get food. But the one thing the brothers have learned, they're triumphing over hardship because they love one another. And this is not an exaggeration. It's not becoming overly religious or anything like this. This is the fact of the matter. When the persecution comes, for some unknown reason, we draw closer together. And our brothers over there are very, very close together, and they share food, they stand in lines, they take up clothes that they have, and they share this, these, the clothing with one another, and therefore, they're prospering in places where the worldly people are not. But what happened to them this summer was something hard to believe. For the late spring, a police official came to one of the brothers who was an elder, and he says, listen, he says, our people to hear that you're going to have district assemblies. And we don't want you, because under martial law, you cannot meet in the woods. We don't want you to go into the woods to hold your meetings. And the brother says, well, I don't know. What can we do? See? And it was like Moses and Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said, oh, you can't go out there in the, wind, in the wilderness. And Moses said, not one foot, uh, hoof will we leave behind. So lo and behold, this official says, Here's what I, I've got a suggestion, he says. Why don't you rent halls? The brother just about dropped through the floor when he heard that, you know. But coming from the police, and the police are in, in connection with the interior department, and that is right up there, right at the top. The top is telling them to go out there and rent halls for their district assemblies. And would you believe they went out to rent halls and they rented over 84 halls in which to hold district assemblies. It's, they had theaters and anything they could get in. Some of them were large enough to hold 6,000 people. And that is unheard of during martial law. They don't let more than 
ten people assembled together, let, all, let alone 6,000 people. And uh, the police went there and listened to the program, and the brothers put on this program, and it was something else. In one theater where our, where our brothers put on the drama, this drama where the father is uh, hesitant that the son is one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and the father says, come, I'm going with you out in service, and then he gives the witness and so forth. Would you believe that in this theater, some of the actors stayed behind? And one of the directors stayed, and he watched this. And after the drama came up to the brothers, and he says, How on earth did you do this? How long did it take you to put on this drama? And the brother said, Well, how long would you think? He said, For us to do a thing like that would take over three months. The brother said, I'll tell you, we put it together in a week. And they did. And believe me, those brothers are real actors, and they do fantastic jobs. In Vienna, I saw them put on this Saul drama. And they did such a beautiful job, you want to run out there and hug them. But the fact is, they know how to put on dramas there. One policeman watching some of the program said, by nature I'm a very hard man. But when I watched that drama, you know that tears came into my eyes? Yes, brothers, a lot of tears came to our eyes. Wish my wife were here, he said. Maybe she'd give up smoking. <laughs> so, this is some of the things that are happening in Poland. You take, for example, there, in, right in Warsaw itself, they had over 4,000 people attending an assembly, 126 baptized. They had summer camps where children went out to witness. They had over 1,500 youths going out there to witness in outlying areas this year, and they had given them 500 addresses to check on. They came back with 3,000 addresses. People are very heartbroken in Poland because they thought that the Catholic Church would do something for them. They thought because they had Wojtyla there as the Pope of Rome, surely the Pope would do something for Poland. And when solidarity went, down went their hope. And now all you have to go to the door today in Poland, and you can. You can do house-to-house -house work in Poland. And, uh, but you cannot take the literature produced by the society, because the Watchtower Society is banned, but not Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses are not banned in Poland. Only the Watchtower Society. So you can go from house to house, take a Bible with you, knock on the door, and say, what do you think is going to happen to Poland? What is the Pope going to do? And those people will keep you there all morning. So the good old Pope has opened more doors and helped us hold more studies than anything in the world there. And we find... People are surprised that we are allowed to go from house to house during this military regime. But the brothers are enjoying it, and it's a marvelous thing. You wouldn't believe it. It was hard for me to comprehend that during solidarity, they were teaching the Bible in the schools. Yes, the Catholic priests were trying to teach the people the Bible in the schools. And the strange enough... In one school, it was reported that the priest had given out lessons. And the next day, he says, I've got a quiz for you. Who is Job? And only one hand went up. And he says, who is Job? And this little hand that went up was a little girl. She said he was a faithful man in Bible history. Lived about the time of Moses, maybe a little before. And this priest looked at her a long time. He says, then, what is the apocalypse? That same little hand was the only one that went up. And he says, who are you? And she says, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And she, he says, I thought so, he said. Isn't that something? But there in the schools, our little brothers and sisters are, this girl was asked to go from school grade to class to class to give lectures on the Bible. Can you imagine? You better be prepared, you young ones. 
You never know what's going to happen to you here, you know. The people appreciate Jehovah's Witnesses from one standpoint in that country because they know we're not afraid of the Catholic Church. We're one organization that doesn't shake in its boots when the priests go by. And the people know it, the police know it, and uh, it's very much appreciated. Why is the government as lenient toward us as it is? We've wondered about that. We've come up with two reasons. One is that many, many people ran out of Poland and went to Vienna, Austria, as refugees. They had a camp out there with 100,000 Poles uh, there feeding off the Viennese people out there. So when we had an assembly and 51 busloads and trainloads of people went into Austria, the Austrians were almost frightened to death. They thought all these people are going to stay. But when all our brothers went back, we build a new name for Poland in Austria. And they appreciate that fact very much. And another thing is, they kind of think that we are a bulwark against exposing the Catholic Church in Poland. The, the communists want somebody to expose the Catholic Church, and who's going to do it? The Baptists are not going to do it. The evangelists are not going to do it. There's one organization that does not fear the Pope. They'll do it. And they're supporting us. And they're hoping that we really expose the Catholic Church real well. So we're not griping about that one bit. We enjoy the fact that we have this heyday in Poland. Tell you what it's like. One of our sisters in a rainy day there was driving her car and she slid through an intersection and she rammed into a man who had a brand new automobile. And you can tell just what he felt like. So he, she struck him bullseye right in the center and he came out screaming, yelling, raising his fists. He called the police. The police came there, and the poor sister apologized all over the place. And the man said that she struck me deliberately. And she says, oh, no, I could never do that. She says, I wouldn't lie to you, officer. She says, because I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. He says, and we're not to lie. He says, Jehovah's Witnesses. She says, you got proof that you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses? She said, yes. So she went back in her car and brought out a watchtower, an illegal magazine in Poland and showed it to him. And he saw this magazine, and he turned on that man whose car was hit, and he says, you get back in that car before I arrest you, and you go on and leave this woman to go. And that sister was struck dumb. She didn't know what happened. And we don't know what happened either. Well, that is what's happening in Poland these days. So you're in if you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And that's good to feel. There was a day when it wasn't that way. And we're not going to forget that either. Because in the communists, the climate can change from day to day, and we're aware of that. Italy, I don't know. Did you hear about this experience in Italy? It's a true one. That this old brother was in a hospital... And they thought he was going to die in the guy. In Italy, every uh, casket has a cross on it. And so the brother said, listen, that's one thing I don't want on my a casket is a cross on it. Will you get that? If I die, get that cross off and put John 5, 28 and 29 there. And so in this little village, lo and behold, he did die. They buried him. They took the cross off and put John 5, 28 and 29 there. And the village priest came by, and he saw this John 5, 28, and uh, he didn't know what it was. And so lo and behold, he went, and he says, well, what on earth did he put on top? Why did he take the cross off? And the brother started the study with this priest, and he came into the truth. And they sent a new priest there. And this new priest went to this old priest and why did you leave? And he says, there, there was this casket, the cross there. They took the cross off. They put John 25, 528, 29. And he holds this 
study with this priest, and that priest comes into the truth. And that's not the end. The church sends another priest to this village, and they tell the priest, now, you, you be careful, you know. And uh, he goes along, and he meets these priests, and he holds a study, and he's coming into the truth. And then they send a fourth priest there, and they put him under oath not to talk to Jehovah's Witnesses. And one day he's walking down the street, and his buddy that was converted, you know, to being one of Jehovah's Witnesses on the street, and he says, hey, and they talk about everything else, and he says, you know, I'm, I'm not supposed to talk to you about, why did you change? And he says, there's this casket, and there's this cross, and there's this... And he came into the truth. And... And the fact is, they closed the church. They closed the church, and today the people, if they want to take communion or anything else, they got to go to another village. And that's the way it's in Italy. In fact, Jehovah's Witnesses is the largest organization, religious organization, outside of the Catholic Church in Italy. In Spain, it's the same. In Portugal, it's the same. And in Poland, it's the same. And brothers, there's a wave going on. Whether it's here in America or not, it makes no difference. We're getting vibrations from around the world that the field has come alive, especially so in the Catholic countries. And it's something to behold. Remember Quebec? We had a war up there in Quebec not too long ago. We were outlawed in the city now, Charlevoix, Quebec. Headlines in the paper says, I witnessed a miracle. And who is he talking about? Jehovah's Witnesses. And that miracle is the two-day kingdom hall being built in Quebec City. And I'll give you just a brief report on it. He says, I was a witness to an unbelievable spectacle before my eyes. A thousand unpaid workers, all Jehovah's Witnesses from all parts of Canada, they came. They did the impossible right directly. There it was. In 36 hours, a temple came before my eyes. Complete. We saw a miracle, an impeccable organization, a machinery of which I never saw in my whole life. It was unbelievable. And yet there it was. Crowds laughed. People talked. They shook hands. And up in the tree was a loudspeaker. And a voice from the loudspeaker said, Brothers, we're going to have a prayer. And he says, After the prayer, over the loudspeaker system, the words came, Go! And there was a huge round of applause, and you never saw such work in your life. He says, now I've witnessed it. He says, where have we been? What a remarkable organization. And that's what you belong to, brothers. A remarkable organization. People are seeing it. If ever there was a time, if ever there was a time that we should be feel proud, yes, proud about ourselves, as it is now, brothers. You see what's happening to the world with all the loss of appreciations and things of this nature. Jehovah's Witnesses should feel proud of their Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah not only has given us an increase, but he's brought in the desirable things of all nations. Yes, he's set Christ as king on his throne. He's given us the faithful and discreet slave. We have directions such as no other organization on the face of the earth has. We ought to bow in appreciation and love of God because we're in for something very, very beautiful. What an organization there is. Paul says, be glad you nations with his people. Yes, be happy. Be happy that you are a part of this nation.
that Jehovah is gathering. And he's gathering for survival into his new system of things. Look at the world about you. Look at his woes. His threat of nuclear war. Look at the natural disasters. And it's almost... It almost seems insane for us to express optimism about the future. But brothers, we believe in the future. We believe in the future because we believe in God. And our God, Jehovah, has made a future for us. And this is something we must never forget, whether we're growing old or we're young or whatever we see in this world. We've got to remember the future that God is making for us. Now, in the days of the Apostle Paul, some of our brothers were rather pessimistic about the future. They looked at the world and they saw how they were winding and dining, living it up, as it were, and these people thought nothing about the way they were living. And the... They thought they maybe have to live that way to get a little bit out of life. Let's live. Be happy. For tomorrow we might die. Sometimes you get this, these vibrations coming to the world. But what does Paul say? Take hold of your Bible. Open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Notice there in chapter 15, beginning with verse 12, Paul is talking about Christ Jesus and the resurrection. And then in verse 19, he says, If in this life, if in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all men most to be pitied. Yes, brothers, read that over and memorize it. If in this life only, if we are only living for today, for the here and now, you're wasting your time being one of Jehovah's Witnesses. You're most to be pitied. You should be, feel very miserable about it. Because there is a future. There is a future for us of God's making. And that is what Paul says right thereafter. However, now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep in death. Christ has been raised from the dead for a reason to become king of a new system of things, for us to enjoy, for people to live here on the face of the earth and enjoy it. Sometimes we hear brothers say this too to us. They say, oh, you know, I'm so happy to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses that if, if this all there was, just being a witness and I were to die tomorrow and there was no more, I would be content. The Apostle Paul says to you, you are of all persons most to be pitied. Don't believe that way. Our God is a rewarder. That's what Paul says in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Our God is a rewarder of those who diligently serve him or seek him. Your labor is not in vain in connection with the Lord. It's not in vain. You don't serve God for nothing. And if God offers you a gift, don't say, I won't take it. And for you to talk this way shows a lack of faith in the promise of God. No, brother, you cannot be happy and live in this world just for the now, in the here. There's got to be a tomorrow, and you have to live for it. And you've got to enjoy it. And you've got to see that tomorrow so it thrills you today. Anything short of that is no good. Living today with a view to the future, brothers, is not only a strength, it's a safeguard for you in this day and age. It's a protection to your faith. You've got to believe in tomorrow if you're going to believe in God at all. You look down in the Bible 
Throughout all Bible history, there were men who believed in tomorrow. What about Abraham? Abraham believed in a city whose builder and maker was God. That's tomorrow. Abraham believed in the messianic city, the kingdom. That's what Abraham believed in. And Jesus, in the book of John, chapter 8, verse 56, what does he tell us? Abraham, your father, rejoiced greatly in the prospect of seeing my day. Notice that word, prospect. Looking ahead to the time to see that day. Abraham rejoiced in that. And he saw it and rejoiced. Now, is that something? Holy Spirit, what a power. Holy Spirit inside of Abraham moved him so greatly that he was able to look over 4,000 years of human history into the kingdom of God and it made him to rejoice. He was able to see it. He was able to see not only the resurrection but the perfection, the reign of Christ Jesus. That's what Abraham saw and he rejoiced. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Rejoice greatly, said Jesus. What about you, brothers? Do you look in that day and do you rejoice? Do you rejoice greatly to see it? David looked at that day and David said that he saw a time when the righteous themselves will possess the earth and that they would dwell forever on it. David was looking ahead. It wasn't in his day. But he saw it, he wrote it, and we use it in our sermons. When we go from door to door, we use that scripture there in the 37th Psalm, verse 29, and we quote it to the people. But do we see it? And when we see it, does it make us to rejoice? You take, for example, Isaiah was inspired to write, Behold, God was going to create a new heavens and a new earth. The former would not be remembered nor even come into mind. That was future. God creating a new heavens and a new earth. And this earth that we're living in today would not even come into the mind. What about Jesus? For the joy that was set before him. Hebrews tells us, Hebrews chapter 12, joy set before him, he endured the torture stake, despised the shame, and it sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. But read those words. The joy that was set before him was the kingdom. King of the kingdom, bringing this earth into perfection and seeing it actually change to the glory of God. Remember how Jehovah says in the book of Isaiah, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, and I'm going to make the place of my feet glorious. Yes, this earth is going to be glorious. But Jesus said he endured the torture state. By believing in the future, brothers, is the way you're going to strengthen your endurance in the Word of God. Now, what future are we talking about? We're talking about Matthew 6, 9, and 10. We're talking about the kingdom. That's what we're talking about. Where Jesus said, let your kingdom come. Come is the future. Then let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's still the future. And we've got to be able to see that future, to have that future influence our lives. Now, Revelation 21, 1 through 4, there the apostle John tells us a little bit more about that future. Notice how John writes, or what he has to say about it there. Verse 2, Revelation 21. I saw also the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, and prepared it as a bride adorned for her husband. With that I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Look, that the tent of God is with mankind and he will reside with them. I wonder how many of us can really conceive of this fact. 
tent of God with mankind, God residing. What way? Holy Spirit? Yes. But there you see God in all of his magnificence going to be reflected here on earth. And he will wipe out every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more, neither mourning nor outcry nor pain be any more. The former things have passed away. And he that sits upon the throne said, Look, I'm making all things new. For these words are full and true. But the thing is, do we see it? And how does it influence us? Does it influence us to the point of rejoicing? Well, it must. Let's look at the book of Hebrews chapter 11 now. We started to talk about Abraham. And let's see the way Abraham was influenced by the word of God. By faith, Abraham, that's verse 8. When he was called, obeyed, and going out into a place that he was destined to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, although not knowing where he was going, and by faith he resided as an alien in the land of promise, as in a, a foreign land. And he dwelt in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the very same promise. And... For he was waiting, awaiting the city, having foundations, whose builder and maker is gone. Verse 13, in faith all these died. Although they did not get the fulfillment of the promise, they saw them afar off and they welcomed them and publicly declared that they were strangers and residents in the land. For those who say such things, give evidence that they are earnestly seeking a place of their own if they indeed kept remembering that place from which they had gone for they would have had opportunity to return but now they're reaching out for a better place that is one belonging to heaven and here's the beautiful thing listen Hence, God is not ashamed of them to be called upon as their God, for he has made a city ready for them. What marvelous advice there is for us, brothers. Not only words, but instruction. You look down there, you see that Abraham gave evidence that he was called, when he was called, he obeyed. That he lived as an alien, he lived in tents. He earnestly sought a better place, he reached out, because he did all of these things, the great God Jehovah is not ashamed of him. Let's take this man Abraham and look at his life briefly here. Go down to the book of Genesis chapter 11 and see how God worked with this man. Now Abraham wasn't perfect. None of the patriarchal men of patriarchal times was perfect. None of us are, and therefore we can relate to these men. You see in the 11th chapter of Genesis, verse 27, and this is the history of Terah. And Terah became father to Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So Terah was the father to Abram. Verse 31, after that Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran and his grandson and Sarai his daughter-in-law, the wife of Abraham his son. And they went with him out of Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. In time they came to Haran and took up dwelling there. And the days of Terah came to be 205 years and Terah died in Haran. Now when you look at this, you get an idea that it was the father Terah, that took Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, right? It says that right there. But you turn open your Bible to Acts chapter 7, verse 2, you get a different picture entirely. In Acts chapter 2, it says that the Lord of glory appeared to Abraham, to our forefather Abraham, while he was still in Mesopotamia, not in Haran, but in Mesopotamia, before he took up residence in Haran. 
And he said to Abraham, Get out from your land, from your relatives, and come on into the land that I shall show you. Why does one say Tira and the other say Abraham? The reason was they lived under the patriarchal society. And Abraham, even though he was married, he came under his father, and his father therefore took the responsibility and initiative to carry out the wishes of Abraham. And therefore we see Abraham under his father going to the land of promise, to the land of Canaan. I don't know how many of you ever stopped to think of what a sight this must have been. See Abraham, 70, some years old, leaving Ur with his father, 200 years old or so, maybe not quite, herding along all the sheep and all the goats and the camels they had any chickens or whatever they had down there. None of this walks very fast. And they're going all the way to Canaan. Now you sisters down there, think of this. You, you think of yourself, put yourself in Sarah's place. And your husband, 70 some years old, now 70 years old, comes up to you and he says, listen, I got this inspiration from Jehovah and he wants me to go all the way to Haran. And he wants me to really go all the way to Canaan and take everything that we have and go there. She said, well, what's going through his head? You know, how? Foot? Yes, on foot. What a trial and what a test that must have been because the animals could not move no more than about anywhere from, they made about eight, nine, ten miles a day. Up that Euphrates River, they went as far as Heron. And there it says that they stopped in Heron. And they took up dwelling there. And it is there that Tira, 205 years, and he dies. But you read your Bible just a little bit further, and you get a little excited there because God then says to Abraham, you stayed long enough in Haran. You've got to get out of there and go to Canaan. You've got to finish this trip. You stop short of your goal. Yes, living in Haran, it says... There that he accumulated in verse 5, 12, chapter 12, verse 5, it says, he accumulated goods there. And it got to be quite comfortable, but God said, you didn't go far enough. There's that land of Canaan yet you've got to go. And then he picks up at God's command, there you read in Genesis chapter 1 there, that Abraham starts off, uh, not chapter 1, but chapter 12, Verse 1. And he takes off and he goes for the land there. And Jehovah proceeded to say to Abram, Go your way out of your country from your relatives and your relatives and from the house of your father to the country that I shall show you. Now notice that Abraham was to leave his country behind. Everything that was dear to him, his father his relatives, everything that was dear to him, and go to the land of God's promise. Now, it must have been something because they had to cross the Lebanon mountains, and they, if they were to cross there, there'd be snow-capped mountains coming out of Ur of the Chaldees. Down there in the south, there's no snow-capped mountains. Up there to see that Lebanon range, it must have been a thrill to him to see those mountains, then come into the cedars of Lebanon, spring of the year, down into the valley of Palestine. It was really a land flowing of milk and honey. Beautiful. Now Abraham might have really, really rejoiced to think, here is a land green, beautiful to live in, marvelous to raising cattle. And But Abraham, when he gets there, verse 10 of chapter 12 is something you should see. Because so many of us, when we come into the truth, when we come into the truth, we think, ah, all my troubles are behind me. Here's the land flowing of milk and honey. I'm going to have it easy. You see, this is the land of promise. But verse 12 tells us that a famine arose in the land. And Abraham made his way down to Egypt to reside there as an alien. Because the famine was severe in the land. 
And so often when we come into the truth, we don't expect famines. We don't expect hardships. We don't expect trials and tribulations. We don't expect to go back to Egypt. But Abraham did. The Bible tells us Abraham went into Egypt. Not the wisest thing in the world, but this is some of the things that he did. Now, Abraham, if you look at his record, he had domestic hardships, he fought a war, he sacrificed his son, his, fi his wife finally dies. But it's not all gloom and doom for Abraham. He had some good times in the land, too. Yes, he had experience with angels. He had a family. He acquired wealth. He was able to witness miracles at the hands of God. He lived to a ripe old age. And he was able to serve Jehovah to be a picture and represent him. Something he represented a life, the type of life that we should copy today, brothers. And that's why we're using this illustration. Because Abraham was moving from one world into another. He was coming out of Ur of the Chaldees with all its pagan worship, with all its of its ways, and he was going to the land of God's promise. And we are doing the same thing today. Abraham endured all kinds of things, and the first thing he learned, and the first thing we must learn when we come out of Babylon the Great, because God does tell us, get out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. First thing we ought to learn is that obedience costs us something. That we don't come into the truth and have everything handed out to us in the platter. It never was that way for Abraham either. Obedience costs. It costs hardships, trials, suffering, persecutions. Abraham left his country, relatives, friends, and he was on his own in the land of promise. And then we find that this was quite a price to pay. But what about Christians? You find if you open your Bibles to the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew, verse there Jesus says, it's 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, notice he begins with the little letter or little word, if. He says, I'm not making you, this is not mandatory, if. This is voluntary. It's on your part. If anyone wants to come after me, let him disown himself. That's a price you have to pay. Let him disown himself, pick up the torture stake, and follow me continually. That's very, very hard to do, brothers. God only in his undeserved kindness helps us out in this respect. You take, for example, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 to 39, Jesus speaking, He that has affection for father and mother, greater than for me, is not worthy of me. And he that has greater affection for son or daughter than for me, is not worthy of me. And whoever does not accept his torture stake, that's the hardships, the trials, the tests, the tribulations, who, don't, who, who does not accept this is not worthy of me. He that finds his soul will lose it. And he that loses his soul for my sake will find it. And that's what we find to be true right now. One thing we learn is that when you come into the truth, first thing we have to do is set our priorities straight. We have to learn that we must seek First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then God will take care of us. Abraham went down to Egypt. It wasn't necessary for him to go there, but he thought he had to. He went. Jehovah called him back, but he lived for almost a hundred years outside of Egypt without having to go back there. God provided for him, and he can for us. This reminds me of a brother that used to be at Bethel. He's deceased now. You might have known him, Brother John Curzon. John Curzon, you can call him anything you want, he was a genius. 
And he was an inventor, an engineer, a designer. Anything you wanted made, he could make it. And this man lived under machines and machines all his life. He dealt with steel. And he lived in his own world. He was almost, he wasn't really an introvert, but there were such great demands on him, and this, this is the way he lived. And one day, he came down in the dining room at Bethel. And this was about 6.30 in the morning, maybe a little earlier than that. And he came up to me and he said, Dan, after 30 years in the full-time work, he says, I finally learned where it is, he says. At last I know where it is, he says. It's not with machines anymore. He says, it's with being with people, being a people's people. He says, from now on, I'm going to carry the good news to people. I'm going to associate with people. Now I understand what the life of Jesus was all about. And the sad fact was that about three weeks later, John died. But the truth is, that's where it is. It's with being with people. If you read in the Watchtower, October 15, 1982, account of Brother Severud, who also is a rather brilliant man, he's a construction, he's a construction engineer, an architect. He was the one that designed many of our Bethel homes. And the fact is that this man felt when he became one of Jehovah's Witnesses, he had a choice to make, either to follow his career or put more time in God's service. And he says, an eternal future in God's purpose is what excited my imagination. I began to see a new direction in my life. I had to spend more time in pleasing God while still supporting my growing family. First, I must serve Jehovah, and then all else will be added and this is how it worked out. And then Brother Severed learned this lesson. He said his priorities right. He put Jehovah first in his life. And for 20 years he pioneered. And then his wife died. And then after she died, he said, My purpose in life is still the same, to serve Jehovah God forever. I try to share in the preaching work every day. At 82 years of age, I still am in fairly good health. So, setting our priorities straight, brothers, putting a goal before us, having a future for which to live is very, very essential in life. And you've got to see this every day of your life. And it's got to be alive. Otherwise, it's not going to mean much to you. Abraham stopped in Haran, but God caused him to move on. And a lot of us stop. You can imagine how many of us coming into the truth, what do we do? Oh, we have all kinds of imaginations, things, the things that we're going to do. Some of us say we're going to pioneer, we're going to go into Gilead, we're going to become missionaries, or we're going to do this and that, but we start on the way, and then things happen to our lives, our parents get old, they may die, and we stop. There's no crime in stopping, but staying put without going further toward your goal, that is what you have to watch and be careful of. God helped Abraham and caused him to move ahead. The rich young ruler, today's morning's text mentions it. The young man wanted everlasting life. He came to Jesus and he said, Master, what can I do to gain everlasting life? And Jesus said, you've got too many possessions. Sell all you have. Give to the poor. Come be my follower. And you're going to have riches in heaven. He wanted everlasting life and Jesus laid it out for him. But he walked away saying, my, the price is too high. It isn't right. There's got to be a better way and there isn't. And the fact is, brothers, I say this because a lot of us, we gain a lot of possessions, and this is what Abraham get. If you can hold it in check, that is fine. This is one thing we learn from the story of Abraham, that life does not come by the things we possess. It comes by our relationship with Jehovah God. 
A lot of brothers get started, but they stop. They stop long enough, and then they find it hard to get started again, to set their dream in motion. And we find once we start, then it's very, very difficult to get started again, especially so in the full-time service. Then we slack off, we, we hold back. And the reason for this is the more saying this is the more devoted we become, the better servants we get and better servants we are. Jesus said, if a man puts his hand to the plow and looks back, he is not worthy. And we've got to remember Lot's wife. A brother in synagogue came up and told me this, and I repeat it here because so many of our brothers, we are out there, we don't know what it's like, some of us, to be so close to Jehovah. We're not in the full-time work, and uh, we, we beg, we plead, but living by the Spirit is a little different. If you taste the Spirit of God, and you have this, and you know how Jehovah provides for you, that is something else. And this brother in Senegal was in a missionary work with his wife there. He came, not to the United States, but a country nearby. And he went with his brothers. And the brothers there said, listen, you were in Senegal five years. Isn't that long enough? Why don't you come home? We need an elder here. You could become an elder. We'll get a job for you. And you can live and be happy here. And the truth is, the brother did quit. He he stopped. He didn't go back to Senegal. And he got a job, and a good one. And he gained possessions, and he was here for about five years. And one day I saw him back in Bethel, and I said, How come? And he said, I'm going back to Senegal. I said, What's the matter? He says, It's true. Everything they said was true. He said, I got the job. I became an elder. But he said, But... I was not as close to God as I was when I was in my missionary assignment. And that is what's bringing me back. And that is the truth, brothers. And sometimes we have to think of that. So when people take up a life of full-time service, a service that Jehovah supplies and cares for them in the way that we may not be aware of. And for Abraham, and people like him, they are very, very close to Jehovah. And they move along by his power to uh, the promised land. At Bethel, dealing with the young brothers at Bethel, this is what our young brothers at Bethel often come in. And they say, listen, Dan, my mom and dad want me home. And I said, what's the matter? And they said, well, they're getting old. And I said, well, don't they have a congregation to go to? Can't the brothers care for them? Yes. But they say they, they would like me to come and help them. And we say, all right, if that's what you want. But the young ba lad comes home, and what does he do? He finds that he's not as young as he used to be, that he wants to get a job. He's growing up. He wants a wife of his own, and he can't supply for mom and dad as they thought he should. And his whole life has changed. And so often we see them saying, I wish I were back at Bethel, you know, serving with you. So it's good for you, brothers and sisters, to give thought to this, that a brother who sets his heart on the full-time work, help him out. Keep him in the full-time service. Have him to draw close to Jehovah, and uh, Jehovah draws close to him. You'll find this was true in the days of Israel. Remember, there were about three million Jews that were 70 years in captivity. And when Cyrus gave the call for them to come out of captivity and return, how many returned? Less than 50,000 returned. Less than 50,000. All of them could have come back, but only 50,000 approximately came back. But to the others, Jehovah said, you Take care of those who are motivated by his spirit because the Bible does tell us in the first chapter of the book of Ezra that the spirit of God roused them up and made them go out in the field. Then the Bible tells that those who remain behind, you support them out there. That's your job. Don't pull them back. Support them in the field, on the way to the new system of things, and Jehovah will bless you for it. 
We're finding many, many brothers responding in various ways to the truth now, in beautiful ways. Brothers are making the kingdom their goal. They're doing their very best to live for it, and they're giving evidence, and they're reaching out for it. A young man was going to university down here in Ohio, wanting to become a doctor. He was very, very good in school. He got the truth while he was going to school. And in school, it puzzled him. He did not know what to do, whether to pursue his course in college or the Spirit was indicating to him that he should take a greater part in the witness work. But what did he do? This young man stopped going to college. Why? He said the words of Jesus impressed him. He said the words that said, what if you gain the whole world and lose your life? What will it profit you? And he thought of this and he said, my goodness, if I gained the whole world, lost my life, it would amount to anything. So he stopped going to the university. He went and became a full-time worker, and to this very day, that is what he is. But here's what he says. Today, he says, I find that the truth proved to be a protection to me. Think of the many hard decisions I would have to make if I were a doctor, blood transfusions, abortions, transplants, and what have you. The truth proved to be not only a blessing, but a protection at this time. So this is the way the Spirit directed him and guided him on the way to life. There was another brother who today is a branch committee coordinator. He was a nuclear physicist, a good paying man, job that he had. And this disturbed him whether he was doing enough in the field service. And this indication is of God. And he went into the full-time service. Today he's in, still in the full-time service. But here's what he says. It was a very hard decision for me to make, to give up my career. But I look back now and see what a blessing the truth has been to me. I dread to think of working on some nuclear bomb that might destroy millions and millions of people. That's what he was in. The truth brought him out, and now out of deep appreciation, he's serving Jehovah. I often think, too, sometimes we have this truth in earthen vessels, and the Word of God is alive and so powerful, I think we underestimate it. Here was the young lad at birth had a defect in his leg, and at four years old, it had to be amputated. Think of that. Four years old. The father was so broken-hearted, didn't know what to do. And what he did, the father reached for the Bible. He was not even in the truth. The father was not at the time. He opened the Bible and began to read to this little four-year-old boy out of the Bible. And he read Isaiah 35, where the lame boy would leap like the deer. Out of the Jerusalem Bible it says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unsealed. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb sing for joy. You would think that four-year-old boy without a leg wouldn't even pay attention to that. And that night that four-year-old boy dreamed that he was running and jumping like a deer. And one day, knock on the door came, and one of the Lord's people came and talked about the new system of things. That family came into the truth. The young boy, when he heard about the new system of things, couldn't think of anything better. That future to him came so alive that he, of course, he got an artificial leg later on. He learned to run, swim, jump, played football, baseball, you name it, he did it. He, in fact, even won the presidential Physical Fitness Award for Athletic Excellence. Today he's at Bethel, this boy. A lovely man. So you never want to underestimate the power of the truth in anybody, even in your children, in yourself, and any person that you talk to. 
The truth is a protection, brothers. We talk about being a protection, and today, living in a violent world, we must think of this very, very much. One of our sisters, there are two of them, in fact, they went to Con Edison to pay their light bill, and this happened in New York City. I know the people. They had just paid the bill. They turned around to walk out, and two gunmen walked in. And they said, hey, this is a holdup. Everybody turn around, put your hands against the wall. Don't shout, don't panic, or we'll blow your head off. They were in there with sawed-off shotguns. And our two sisters were there. And, uh, of course, the gangsters said, don't panic, but everybody panicked. They shrieked, they were yelling, and one lady in that place said, Oh, Lord Jesus, save me. And the gunman said, Oh, shut up, he says, I will blow you to pieces. And our two sisters there said they had trained themselves to cry out to Jehovah. And this one girl said, I said out loud, Jehovah, save me. And the gunman said, Who said that? And this girl, she was 13 years old, said, I did. He says, come on. And the two sisters stepped forward, and another woman came out with her. And he says, you girls can go. And the sisters were so afraid, they froze. They couldn't move. They couldn't walk. They were scared. And the, the one woman that was with them said to the gunman, oh, thank you, thank you. He says, oh, you go back in line. He says, I didn't mean you. He says, I mean these two girls. And then he looked at him, and they were still standing there, and he says to you, you go, he says, run, he says, oh, before I change my mind. And they ran, and they were saved. Now, that's not a story. I know the people firsthand. They have learned to call on the name of Jehovah. Jehovah is a strong tower. The righteous run into that name and are saved. Sometimes we think this is superstition and it isn't. We're going to have to learn about our relationship with Jehovah as we move on to that new system of things and get protection from it. And they were saved, and they were protected by that. A four-year-old boy, when he heard this ex experience in, this, in one of the Bible studies, he says, I want to tell you that at school, one of the big bullies in school wanted to st steal my skateboard. He wasn't four years, he was eight years old. And he said, you want to steal my skateboard? And I, uh, he says, I told him, you can't steal my skateboard. I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and I'm not afraid of you. And he says, when I told him I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses, he ran from me. <laughs> so this young four-year-old is learning to call on the name of Jehovah. And I say, let's not sell God short in the holy angels. He has promised to do marvelous things for his people. And believe me, he's doing it. And it is a marvelous thing. 